Okay, um, it's a tough act to follow because that was so beautiful. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, yes, um, so a very warm welcome to this panel on uh, feminist approaches to Nordic peace. Uh, my name is Elise Ferron. I'm a senior research fellow and an associate professor at the Tampere Peace Research Institute in Finland. And I'm uh, absolutely honored and delighted to be chairing this panel. Uh, so we have actually four panelists. Uh, one will be online um, and three are here. Um, so let me briefly um, uh, introduce the panelists. So online we will have Gunil hugenson yov who is Professor of Peace and Conflict Studies at the Center for Peace Studies at the Arctic University of Norway. Uh, then uh, we will have Louise Olsen, who is Research Director at PRIO uh, um, in, in Norway. Uh, then uh, we have Celia Barra uh, omars dottir who is Professor of International Relations here at the University of Reykjavik. Uh, of Iceland, sorry. Uh, and uh, finally, we have Louise Ridden, who's a postdoctoral researcher at the uh, University of Tampere in Finland. Uh, so um, maybe, maybe before, uh, before moving on to asking questions to, uh, to the panelists, um, I want to uh, say a few words about the field of feminist peace and feminist peace research in particular, because maybe some of you are not really familiar with it. Um, uh, first, I have to say that uh, over the past uh, few years, the, the field uh, of feminist peace research uh, has dramatically blossomed. It has emerged as a vibrant and cutting edge field um, that has already provided, um, I think, a lot of uh, and significant academic and political uh, innovation. Uh, one of the main emanations of uh, the feminist peace research uh, field has been the creation in 2016 uh, of a feminist peace research network, uh, which now gathers more than 100 uh, academics and activists from all around the world. Uh, all of these activists are interested in emphasizing feminist contributions to peace studies. Uh, the Feminist Peace Research Network, interestingly, uh, was created jointly uh, by uh, universities located in Finland, Sweden, and Norway. So even if the network uh, nowadays expands well beyond the Nordic countries, because it includes, as I said, scholars and activists from uh, all continents, uh, the Nordic countries uh, continue to, uh, to play a major role uh, in, in the field of feminist peace research. Uh, this is one of these uh, fields of peace studies where the Nordic countries are really at the forefront. So I think it's only uh, uh, legitimate, therefore, that there would be a panel uh, on this uh, during this conference. So uh, the aim of this panel is to open up a discussion on uh, feminist approaches to peace, uh, highlighting their, their potential, but also their limits, the debates existing within the field, because it's a very uh, diverse uh, field, obviously. Uh, so um, first, maybe before, uh, um, I, I would like to, to, to give the floor to Gunhild. Gunhild, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, oh okay. good God. I'm seeing myself now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. I am now seeing, I'm looking down on this auditorium and I'm staring at me on the screen, which is very disturbing. See you, Gunild. Uh, so, um, Gunild, I, I would like to, to hear your thoughts uh, about uh, the, the potential uh, contribution of feminist peace uh, research uh, to understanding the problems we are, we are currently facing. So I know, I know you have some strong views about this, so I think it would be like nice to start with these strong views. The floor is yours. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much, Elise. And, and I'm I mean, I do apologize that I'm not there. It was a question of, am I going to keep on traveling or do I sit still for a little bit? So I'm sitting still, but it's very strange being on a screen when no one else is. So, uh, and it's nice seeing all the familiar faces there. Um, and, and yeah, uh, I have some strong opinions. And actually when uh, it was asked of me, can I say something about feminist approaches to, to peace and, and towards Nordic peace? And, well, I guess I'm very good at complaining because I just thought, uh, uh, what, what have we done lately? Take a look at what's happening around. And um, 
I'm not feeling inspired. I'm not feeling the warmth. I'm, and I'm not seeing impact. At least on an, a middle, uh, on, a, on an immediate front, then I'm thinking, yes, here we can see an impact from feminist uh, peace research. I can't necessarily say so much about that, but particularly feminist security studies, critical security studies. We have been at this for 30 to 40 years. And where is the impact? Uh, and so, actually, I have to sort of take a bit of a step back and think mm, there, there are impacts, but uh, right now it's actually really frustrating, I think. Um, but it makes us all the more uh, obligated to think about what, what has been produced in a large body of literature as well as in policy. What do we continue have to take with us when thinking about the potential for peace, even if we ain't really seeing much of it yet, or, or we do see it in many parts of the world. But uh, at the moment, um, there's so many stresses from Russia, Ukraine, for sure, but not least now what's happening in, in Israel, uh, which, I mean, I think your previous panel was already going there, Nagorno-Karabakh, um, Yemen, Myanmar, uh, not least Afghanistan, and I think I heard in your last panel uh, talking about, yeah, is that peace? Because I don't know, like that ain't peace from my standard. I, I don't even know if I have good standards, but that, that would not be it. Not when you have over half of the population uh, restricted in the ways that, that they are in Afghanistan. And then we have, of course, the, the, the ongoing, but will be increasing refugee situation around the world and the way it's being handled or rather not handled, uh, particularly by the countries that uh, are better, better in a situation to support people who are fleeing uh, both war but also climate change uh, induced incidences as well as uh, economic migration. So it's kind of hard not to get really, really depressed. Normally by this point, I will have used about 500 swear words, but I just thought I'd probably be a little polite, which is unexpected by most people. But uh, I don't know who's behind this screen, so I thought I'll just, just be really nice. But if you just inject your own swear words, that's how I feel about the situation today. Uh, so that being said, is there anything that I think we can learn? Still, I think we can. And in fact, even given the situation today, even when we hear a lot of these big boys, I underlined that word big boys, particularly those of the, um, how do you call it, the offensive realist uh, position that say, this is the uh, start of a great game or it's a continuation of a great game. It's all about great powers. And those who are underneath the great powers have nothing to say, I call bullshit. So there you go, there's my swear word. Um, from feminist security studies and peace studies as well, we learned that even though we're not doing it well, listening is key. There has to be listening. Thinking locally. This does not make local the panacea. This does not make the local some sort of like uh, bastion of peace because it absolutely isn't. But it is nevertheless very important to have a sense of what's happening locally. So the notions of great games where it's only about great powers, Russia, US, China. No, it can't be. And we're seeing why it can't be. And I'll, I'll get into that. Um, and therefore thinking civilian, and, and I've been trashed a little bit for using the term civilian because it sounds so militarized. I don't know if you want to call citizen, but not everybody is a citizen, whereas everyone or many people can still be a civilian while not being a citizen. A citizen is a de designation, of course, uh, with regards to one's citizenship. Um, but if we think civilian or average people, um, this is something we, we need to be doing. Understanding that security perceptions, in fact, differ at different levels of, well, we can say as a political scientist, at different levels of analysis, but let's say just different levels. The state, sub-state organizations and, and societal levels, as well as at the level of the individual. We can talk about human security. Human security differs somewhat from, well, quite a bit, actually, you could say from even individual perceptions of security, because human security, despite all of its faults, still tries to maintain a sense of inclusivity, 
but we see articulations of individual security bubbling up at the local level, which are more exclusive and gets into actually what the song or the poem was about that was in the performance that we just heard, uh, including people or excluding. And these value wars are taking place at the local level and trying to influence the local level. So we see that the insights coming from feminist security and, and peace studies are extremely relevant today. And I'll just, I, I mean, this is a great opportunity to sort of plug away about the research that I do. I'm really interested in the ways in which different, different levels of threat activities are taking place around the world to in fact engage local levels. And this we need to be cognizant of. And it also demonstrates to us just how bloody important it is to think about these local levels. What I mean here is, is that we have quite often, at least of traditional security studies or, or peace studies, you know, we thought about the state and then the state against state wars. And then we also thought about like civil wars. And yeah, there was sort of like more sort of groups against each other in these groups. Today, we see that although war is taking place, both in the way that we have sort of traditionally been used to with the use of militarized uh, weapons or military weapons, the traditional, like a tank, a gun and all that, there's an amazing number of uh, activities, tactics that are being used to actually try to undermine societies before any weapons or traditional weapons are, are coming into play. This involves sabotage, espionage of a variety of sorts, which can be your traditional spying, your illegalist spying, uh, drones, uh, information gathering. Information gathering is turning into just a mega sport um, around the world, not just to kind of keep an eye on each other, but also to use that information, if it can be combined in a certain way, can be thrown back at a society to attempt to destabilize that society. Uh, and, and I've already mentioned the sabotage, information, disinformation, uh, the use of that influence operations, attempting to influence societies, people, average people, and influencing their values and using not just disinformation uh, from sources that are hard to attribute, like, oh, we're not too sure where this came from. When I talk about disinformation, I mean, it can, the best type of disin uh, disinformation is that which is using, uh, something we know is actually pretty truthful, but then just twists it a little bit, gives it a little um, twist on the narrative to sow doubt, to sow mistrust within societies and see if this can build up. It's very effective using existing political cleavages in a society. Let's take migration as an example, because often that's a a lovely kernel of discord in a lot of societies. Well, what do we do with all of these migrants, particularly in Europe? So using issues that are already a little bit uh, fired up and then trying to twist these around through, through disinformation. But then there's also the propagation of disinformation, not through you know, uh, sources that you can't really attribute, but from people who are in positions of trust that can be politicians, that can be media, that can be academics who are also uh, making statements that in fact uh, would fall into a disinformation category. What this means is that security is not about states, or it's sure it's about states, but not just about states. It is about the societal levels. It is about human security perspectives and individual security perspectives. And when I say that, it, go, it breaks down to each and every individual because there are those who are thinking inclusively and say, we need to keep our society together. We need to have the capacity to see us as a, a unit, even though we're very different, but that we're an inclusive and we, we accept and allow everyone. And this is what a lot of feminist security studies and peace studies have been taking a look at the role of inclusion, the importance of inclusion, of accepting people for who they are, how they self-identify, rather than using identity as a weapon, as saying, ah, you are of that identity, you need to stay away. And that my individual security is contingent upon you not being here. Therefore, I'm excluding, I'm trying to get you out of the room. So 
a lot of the narratives that are being thrown around today, particularly through, say, disinformation uh, and um, yeah, the propagation of, of certain narratives, which are just ridiculously uh, being disseminated through through um, what is it called? You know, social media, uh, particularly social media, but all the technology we have to send out information to people faster than ever before at, at amounts that are far greater than ever before. So we are subjected to, to all of this. It's attempting to, to split us and to split us from not from being less inclusive and being more exclusive. We can see that geopolitics, in fact, is splitting not along lines of borders so much, but being defined by fault lines of values. A lot about what we learn from feminist security studies and, and peace studies enter into that space because it's looking at identities that are defined through, through our perceptions of gender, our own gender identities, sexual orientations, then also combined with, and, and this is getting into in, the intersectional lens, um, combined with uh, class, age, uh, I said sexual orientation, um, race, ethnicity, and, and so forth that are trying to find ways to rip societies apart along these identity lines. And for some it's working and you see sort of the, the way geopolitics is making use uh, or at least actors who are influential in geopolitics are making use of values and the impact it has at the individual level to split societies. So that rather than going along the fault lines of borders, well, not that there's always fault lines on a border, but along the cross of a border, we're looking at it as uh, through, through values, how you perceive a family, how you look at reproductive rights, how you take a look at sexual identities. Uh, Gunil, there was an advertisement last summer Gunil, uh, from, oh yeah, Gunil, sorry, do I have can, to can I, now? Can I, may I ask you to, to maybe yeah. conclude? And... Uh, yes, okay. I will conclude, but that that is basically to understand what's happening in our world today. We have to have an understanding that's coming from feminist security and, and peace studies. There we come up, not just with the threats and the way threats can be constructed, but we are also capable of taking a look at the way solutions can be in, uh, constructed, taking on board what's happening at the individual le level, how it meets or or conflicts with the societal level and likewise with the state. Right now we're looking at a Rubik's cube of security constellations. And the trick today is using feminist security uh, and peace perspectives to see how we can match the Rubik's cube up as much as possible. So that's my Sorry thank, for being thank, so you so, thank you so much, Gunilda, and sorry for interrupting, but uh, I, I think that many of the points you make, actually, we will come back to. Uh, I think Gunilda uh, uh, already um, uh, underscored some of the, the specificities lying within the fe a feminist peace uh, approach. Uh, for, uh, for instance, I, I noted the importance of the local and the stress put on the local, uh, the importance of listening, the importance of inclusivity, uh, the different understandings of security um, uh, that, that feminists put forward, and also, um, last but not least, also, Gunil, you mentioned the attention to intersections and the different identities that people have and how this uh, affects their positioning in conflict and vis-a-vis -vis violence, for instance. So uh, I'm going to start uh, with a, a, a series of questions, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, inviting you to elaborate on this. So um, how do feminist peace research approaches contrast with or add to conventional peace and conflict studies approaches? I, I, I assume that some in the audience are not necessarily familiar uh, with, with this. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, uh, to what other types of violence than physical violence uh, does feminist uh, peace research draw our attention? Uh, and also how um, have feminist approaches contributed to recent debates on, on peace, especially in light of recent events, uh, of course, in uh, Ukraine and in Israel, Palestine, and, and what kind of um, ideas and practices uh, have they contributed to bring to, uh, to the fore? Um, so who wants to start? I, I see uh, Louise uh, nodding. <laughs> I was just trying to be supportive. <laughs> Thank you. I can, uh, I can start. 
Um, yeah, I, I think it, it's, uh, it's always tricky to sort of be at, the, at the, a panel at the end of a very interesting conference because there's been so many uh, key points, I think, that has been brought up during these days that are also captured in, in your excellent question for this panel. Uh, so I, I'm trying to make sense of, of my, um, my thinking, but I would like to make uh, a few points related to sort of how feminist approaches have contributed with a specific focus, I think, on, on sort of how we approach, how sort of it has helped us approach the questions we are discussing here, and particularly bringing up aspects that I, I think also in the sense of, of going forward related to, to understanding women's agency, because I think what has really been highlighted throughout this entire conference has been the importance of understanding women's rights in the context of, of conflict resolution, and better understanding of women's agency when we are trying to move towards peace, but also during uh, an armed conflict. Uh, and I think the reason, I, I think uh, like Gunhild underlined, there's been a, a we, we have a, a long way to go, um, but in many respects we have also really moved forward. And I think your, your point about now the sort of many of the vibrant uh, environments that exist uh, here, uh, and, and I would actually like to broaden it even further, because I think by now we have uh, we have the, the sort of those environments, sort of research environments that really focus directly on gender. But I think we also see a great influence on on other areas that are really interested in picking up the gender perspective and what that can tell uh, to their theories. Um, and I think that feminist research has really made an. an an absolutely sort of critical uh, point here, because when, when I started, there was basically no one who understood what this was about, and, and why would you study women and war, or men and war? Or do you mean that men don't fight, uh, so men fight and women don't? What, what, what do you mean? Uh, and I think we moved a long way from that. So now when I say that I'm interested in gender equality dynamics or on conflict, there are very few who, who question why, why that is relevant. And I can also see that at uh, PRIO, where uh, we now have a very large group of people interested coming to the gender research group meeting that, that come in through this from very different perspectives, from the hardcore statistics to the anthropological. So it's really it's a very broad, broad span. And one of the critical things that I, I, I think uh, came sort of why we see that is that in the beginning, it was very difficult to come into this because the, the way we understood war, the way we understood peace, and the way we looked at violence were very excluding to how women were affected and what women's roles could, could be or, or, or were in this situation. So it was even difficult to, to get into the, the conversation. So I think what feminist research really did was try to open up those concepts. Uh, to, to say that, well, if you're looking at peace, like we were talking about yesterday, it's not just the absence of violence. It's not the same kind of peace in North Korea as it is in Norway. We have to look at what was included in that peace. And that gender equality and women's rights constituting 50% of the population is really quite core if you want to understand what kind of peace you actually have. And the fact that you're not drawing on all of society's resources in order to create that peace is a very negative thing. And, and feminist research has really been critical in, in driving that. And that's also been the foundation of the international norms we have today. So I think in that way, we are, are really moving uh, forward. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, also, we had to break through a lot of these, these barriers and, and biases. And I think we've learned quite a lot from the conflicts, unfortunately, in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, because that took on the idea that something, sort of women's security situation in war is just an unintentional side effect. So if you just stop the war, then women's security will improve. It's, it's not a, a deliberate thing to target women in armed conflict. And what we saw in Yugoslavia and what we saw in, in Rwanda uh, was that this violence was actually directly targeted at women for a very specific purpose. So it, it was very clear that, that we had to understand also war from how it affected men and women, how, how they engaged, and also then the gendered dimension to that. So how you, in the narratives you play on masculinity and femininity. So I think they really made sort of central contribution to that, that I, I think that even though we have to fight the, the frustration that Gunnil was portraying, uh, it, it is, we are moving forward. And I think now what we, what I think when we, we think about what we then learn from and understand the Ukraine conflict, uh, I think that 
That has also, in many ways, sort of highlighted how this conflict targeted civilian infrastructure. We saw sort of the attacks against the uh, uh, sort of the, the healthcare that um, for for uh, women and, and uh, uh, sort of giving birth to what you, I'm, I'm forgetting the, the term maternity. Hmm? Maternity. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh, so uh, so how that sort of actually is part of the armed conflict, how directing violence at, at the kind of infrastructure actually plays into it, and also how women are engaged in that conflict. And I think sometimes we are, they are, in Ukraine, they are telling us how important it is to understand how violence affects uh, in, in gender terms. And I think we are not good enough at listening to what they're actually saying and what that could also mean for how we think around security and women and men's participation in our own national security. So I think there are important dialogues in terms of the listening to the women and the men in Ukraine. So what, 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 what are the scenarios we're seeing here? Uh, and I think that also in a sense brings me to the, uh, the point on, on the narratives uh, around this that, that are highly gendered and a, a way of, of thinking around this. Because I think it was quite striking that we haven't moved forward. And I think Sanam made a very good point yesterday in terms of underlining that we, we still talk about women as if they lack agency. Uh, so there was a lot in the media and also in some studies when, when uh, the situation broke out uh, when, after the invasion in Ukraine with the situation of the refugees. There was often quite described as, well, women and children are, are running. Well, in most societies, the gendered roles are that women are responsible for children and elderly. So it, it was rather the case that the women were actually taking the children and also taking care of the elderly and trying to get out of harm's way. And so it's sort of really how we talk about women's agency and seeing what they're actually contributing makes a huge difference, which is one of the classical arguments, I think, also coming from feminist research. But I think that in that we also have a, a, a way forward in sort of understanding the connection between women's security and uh, uh, sort of uh, their, their agency, because uh, uh, for a long time, time, it, we had a lot of focus on the structural factors. And I think feminist research was also critical in bringing up that the structural factors uh, sort of constitute uh, a key problem. But on the other hand, what we're now also seeing, particularly from women human rights defenders, is that, well, we also have to think, if we're actually talking about women's political agency, that also means that, of course, women are taking on force that they are using violence. So how do we also see the connection between agency and security? Uh, and, and sort of being better at, at realizing, because if you look at the data, there's a very large proportion of the violence targeting women is actually very strategic from political actors, sometimes because they are women speaking, but sometimes also because they represent political interests. Uh, so, so how do we make that uh, clear? And in that, also undertake to realize that our assumptions, our gendered assumptions, again, against while men are targeted with violence, are also highly gendered. Because there we have, from the outset, assumed that men are targeted because there are agents. Uh, but actually, what research also shows is that most men, even in a war zone, are not agents for violence. They're not part of this dynamic at all. But they are often targeted as civilians because they are assumed to be agents. So we, we sort of play with both the, the practical effects, but also our thinking that really limits our understanding of, of these issues. So I think that it's now that we're moving forward the, towards the, the 25th anniversary of Women, Peace and Security, I think understanding agency better is really a critical area. Yeah, thank you so much, Louise, for this uh, uh, very interesting points you make. I think indeed uh, uh, th there's, there is also something interesting about the field of feminist peace research itself because it's, it was really born out of this focus on women, you know, as victims of conflicts mm -hmm. and claiming rights for women. And nowadays, when you look at the cutting edge fields of uh, uh, feminist peace research, it's also looking at men, at sexual and gender minorities, it's looking it's looking at inequalities in, in general. So it's not just about women anymore. It's, 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 it's much broader than this, and it can help to, to understand so many, uh, so many uh, you know, other issues in conflicts, not just the victimhood uh, of women or assumed victimhood of women. Um, uh, Celia, you want to take from now on? Yes, uh, well, so many uh, interesting points already made. I, um, I'll try to uh, not repeat what uh, Gunhild and uh, Luisa said, but I think um, maybe where I want to start is uh, with the, the point that you were making that 
uh, whereas we started looking at the role of women and the status of women in conflict and uh, how women can be agents of peace. What we're doing now is, is far beyond that simplistic um, sex divide. The, the binary is, is not our concern anymore uh, in, in the same sense. So we're looking at masculinities and femininities and we're employing intersectionality to look at all the different dynamics of race and class and uh, citizenship and ability or disability, uh, where people live and, and the languages they speak and, and all these different, uh, these categories that Gunhild was talking about and how we can avoid using them as ways of exclusion and of uh, violence. Uh, to uh, use them as categories that create or add to uh, security. Um, and another thing that I wanted to mention is, of course, peace, uh, you know, talking about binaries, we, we have this tendency to think about peace and conflict or peace and war as, as opposites. And I think uh, feminist peace research more than maybe other types of research, feminist, other types of peace research is maybe more focused on, um, and Luis, you sort of touched on this, that Peace is different in North Korea or Norway, and that, that peace isn't an end point. It's a, a constant uh, progress, constant work towards improving society. And, um, and that's something where we can um, also uh, not just rest on our laurels and say, you know, oh, well, we've done this. You know, Women, Peace, and Security uh, was passed in, in 2000, 2001, and, and you know, we're, we're still working on it. We're still improving international society. It's, is still adding on ways of understanding and, and building on, uh, on that big step. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that uh, we see in conflict is um, that traditional gender roles are, um, uh, they, they break up because uh, even though women now participate far more in militaries than they did in the past, and, and women have always participated in some sense, even if it's not in combat roles, uh, we see uh, women take on, uh, and, and, and uh, people of, of different genders, taking on the roles that uh, the soldiers normally conduct uh, at home. So uh, what, what feminist peace research helps us to do is, is to identify what these roles are because the absence of a huge part of the population that is used to doing certain things means that we can see uh, how we divide uh, our labor and, and so on. And, um, and, and that also uh, leads us to think about the importance of care and emotion when it comes to uh, uh, building peace. Uh, how do we expect care to be conducted and who does it? Um, we, when we started preparing for this panel, there was not an ongoing militarized conflict, military conflict. Uh, in, in uh, Gaza, as it is now. Uh, I've, I've, I've been watching the feed, the social media feeds of uh, friends of mine, and one of the interesting things, because the, it's the everyday stuff that interests me more than the, the high level, um, you know, where the, the, the bombs are being directed. How, how does this affect people on the ground? And watching uh, friends on either side of the conflict talk about how to get laundry done. Uh, doing laundry for soldiers who are being uh, summoned or, or, or are being taken out of their everyday life and, and sent to the front line. Uh, it's, uh, it, it sort of changes the way that you think about, you know, what, what is important and uh, what is military. And that maybe brings me to, uh, because uh, Iceland uh, was now for, I can't remember what year in a row, just uh, we just got the ranking of the most peaceful country in the world from the Institute for Economics and Peace. And, uh, and of course we do not have a military and I think most of us feel incredibly lucky that we don't have to think about our uh, loved ones going into military service in this increasingly unstable environment. But uh, we've seen and we have a report coming out from the Institute of International Affairs next week uh, on a survey uh, on, on, on Icelanders' uh, attitudes to foreign affairs or, or international politics. And we were seeing an increasingly, a massive increase in support for NATO and a perception that NATO is what ensures our security uh, beyond our peaceful relations and peaceful standing. Uh, so there's a, a, a sort of a, a jump into this militarized perception of security. 
And uh, one of the things that uh, we saw happen here in the last year that I found extremely interesting was this uh, uh, social effort called Sending Warmth, where individuals in Iceland, uh, different ages, men and women, probably people of other genders, were knitting socks and sweaters made out of Icelandic wool and sending them to Ukraine. And this is, of course, at some level, it's a, a, it's, it's a, a reaction of, of care, uh, wanting to send support. But I think it's also a way of showing uh, and I, that I think nothing but feminist peace research uh, or peace analysis uh, would help us see that it's a way of militarizing society. We were, these people were participating uh, in a war effort that Icelanders really haven't done before. So I think that's uh, these kinds of, of everyday actions and uh, events that, that we can see. Um, and uh, I'll try to start to wrap up, but I think also another, uh, and that this uh, brings me back to Israel and Gaza, is that in feminist peace research, it's, uh, uh, there's also this uh, tendency to, to show solidarity with those affected by conflict. And uh, in Israel and Gaza now, that's, uh, you know, we, 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 of course, I think everybody uh, feels, wants to support the people who were affected by Hamas's uh, uh, attack on, on Israel. But it's complicated there because we also want to, uh, or at least I can speak for myself, show solidarity with the Palestinian people, the, the people living in Gaza who have been uh, subjected to uh, uh, occupation to, uh, you know, even it's not directly occupation now in Gaza, it's uh, uh, been, um, it's been basically isolated for 15, 16 years. Uh, but the, the solidarity with those who are oppressed. So there's also, again, this, this, the binary that is like an either or, which is often in more uh, like realist of approaches to uh, the study of international relations, I think. Um, the feminist perspective allows us to have sympathy and try to show solidarity with people on both sides of, of, uh, of a conflict or all sides because uh, there are individuals, uh, it's the, uh, the, 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 the individuals who are being uh, subjected to oppression and, and violence. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, maybe one final point because uh, Gunhild spent some time on, on the idea of disinformation. I think also we, we have, um, we need to be active there. There's a lot of disinformation that is activated um, by talking about children and uh, the need to protect children. We are seeing this here in Iceland now with the need to protect trans children. And it's not people wanting to uh, allow these children to uh, express themselves according to the way that they identify. It's people who want to prevent that, who, who employ this protection language, and it goes back to the myth of protection, which of course comes from feminist scholarship as well in, in, in conflict. And, uh, and, and this was, there was at least uh, popular reporting in the US, if not scholarly research, on how the idea of uh, protecting children was employed to, to get women engaged in uh, misinformation uh, and uh, uh, just continue to promote that. And I think that the, these are, yeah, these are among the things that I think we need to uh, talk about. And we hopefully yeah. have a few more minutes. After yeah. Response. Uh, thank you so much, Celia. I think these these are very valuable insights. And uh, what you were saying about the, the how, how a feminist peace research sees the relation between peace and, and war differently. Mm -hmm. It also refers to a very important notion in peace uh, in feminist peace research, which is the notion of continuum of violence, mm -hmm. uh, so that there is a, a temporal, uh, there are temporal continuities between uh, the war situation and the and peace situation, like for instance, the types of structural violence that can be found both in, uh, in war and peace, for instance. And, um, and I think that ties in nicely with your work, uh, Luis, because Luis has, has been doing work on uh, an armed civilian protection and the politics of nonviolence, and uh, so looking at this niche of peace in the midst of conflict, or at, at least these practices of care uh, in the middle of violence. So I don't know, Luis, if you want to say also a few words. Yes, absolutely, and, and thank you to everyone. Um, there have been so many interesting um, points raised already that I'm afraid I might not say anything new. 
um, but I will, I will try to kind of respond and contribute to these points. Um, I think what you're saying about challenging these binaries is so important, and that's something we see with unarmed civilian protection. So unarmed civilian protection is a non-violent method or, or group of methods of civilian to civilian and civilian self-protection. And really what this is, is a recognition of the fact that whether it's um, violence from armed conflict, other forms of communal violence, or even um, kind of natural disasters that we might see, floods or earthquakes, the first responders are almost always civilians in their own communities with acts of care and support responding to their own communities to help themselves and each other before or until um, international support can get there. And, and at times, as has been said many times over the past few days, that international support may never arrive. Mm -hmm. So really, it's kind of taking seriously the work, and it is work that civilians do, protection work in protecting their own communities. And this does a few things, but one of the really important things that it can do is start to challenge and break down these binaries, because traditionally, in peace and conflict studies and kind of emphasis on the and conflict studies, when we talk about protection and these myths of protection, we assume that the protectors and the protected are two entirely separate categories. And we need these strong men, and it is, it is men, um, you know, over 95% of, of uniformed peacekeepers are men, to come and save these kind of weak and vulnerable women and children. And again, we have this category of women and children, as Louise said, and, and I really agree with this point, that um, when we say women and children, it's, that's not kind of an accurate category. And I would go even further to say that it not only this category of women and children, not only kind of disguises the work and the loss and the trauma of kind of fleeing across borders, particularly with um, dependent children. What it does to women is infantilizes them because it places them within this category of children and recasts them as this kind of homogenous and one-dimensional group of people that are in need of saving, often by men and often by the international community. And it completely does away with, well, with two things, really. With the agency, because women are agential actors in armed conflict. And also with complexity and identity by kind of homogenizing women. And this is something that's been brought up quite a lot over the past two days, really the complexity of war. And again, this is something that I think um, feminist peace research can help us to understand, to kind of build on what other people have been saying. Is that often, traditionally, we think of war, it's this kind of really big category. And um, I was chatting to someone at lunch that kind of was saying, what do we mean by war and what do we mean by peace? And there are these, these enormous categories that hide a kind of multiplicity of extreme human suffering. And something that, that we can do in feminist peace research is to understand war not only as a kind of geopolitical and militarized inevitability or consequence or event often, but actually to take seriously and to understand war as an experience because that's what war is when it's enacted through kind of praxis and practice. It's something that people experience and it's embodied and it's lived. And this example you were saying about doing laundry, I, I think is so important because ultimately war and armed conflict often frame the kind of backdrop to people's yeah. lives, but people still try to go to work and to school and to feed their families, you know, and people maintain and build new relationships and they lose relationships and friendships and all of these things. And I think something really valuable for all the kind of frustrations, I admit, um, we should hold these frustrations, they're important. But for all of them, I think this is something really valuable that feminist peace research allows us to do, is to really take seriously that which often exists outside of traditional forms of peace and conflict or security research, 
because it lets us take seriously the everyday and the kind of the feeling and the emotion and the experience, the embodied experience of armed conflict. And I think that's really important because without that, this extreme human suffering becomes kind of numbers or, or geopolitics or something that's kind of experienced over there by those other people who are kind of flattened as, as one dimensional and we lose this kind of complexity and that's really a shame. And then the final um, point I wanted to make, which, which comes back to my research and the question you actually asked me, I'm sorry, <laughs> okay. is what does feminist peace research allow us to do? And the final thing I think that it allows us to do is to understand these really small scale acts of care and of love and of non-violence in areas of armed conflict. Mm -hmm. And that might be community early warning, early response mechanisms. It might be plans that people make to help elderly people or people with mobility issues to flee. It might be methods of engaging with armed actors to negotiate passage to medical assistance or these kinds of things. And that isn't to say that, and, and I'm sure, sure we'll come back to this, that isn't to say that kind of suddenly there is a, a pacifist response that fixes armed conflict. But what it is to say is that war exists within peace and peace always exists within war. And it's really important that we're able to move beyond these binaries to, to hold this complexity together I think, to really understand war as an experience and to see that which we're often not able to see because we, we homogenise areas affected by armed conflict. Is, that is a dangerous space and this is a safe space. And, and moving away from that centralisation in these binaries is... It can be difficult and, uncom and uncomfortable and, and complicated. And someone... Uh, once said to me they felt like it was nailing jelly to a wall. And maybe it is, right? It's difficult to get hold of. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to do it. And I think learning to sit with this discomfort is also really important. We don't have a right to be comfortable all of the time. Um, yeah. uh, thank you so much. I, I, I think we, we, we are not short of discomfort these days as peace researchers, but yeah, <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Louise. Um, I, um, I, I, I want to leave a bit of time for debate, uh, so I, I will uh, be asking you a last question, and uh, I will also ask Gunild if she's still online. Um, uh, and, and I would ask you to please be, be very brief in your answer, like one minute maximum. So uh, basically, what are in your views the main debates and contentions in, uh, in uh, feminist peace uh, circles currently? Uh, what can we learn from these debates? So basically, what now? What do we do now? What's the way forward in your view uh, um, in, in uh, feminist peace studies? Gunild? Oh, great. Let me answer first. <laughs> uh, oh, really good inputs, by the way. So I very much enjoyed listening to, um, to, to all of you. Uh, and I mean, I can't solve the problem of where, you know, where can feminist peace and research and security studies go, uh, go today. Um, but of course, I still have an opinion on it. Uh, and I'm thinking of engaging uh, maybe it's because that's that's what I'm interested in. And I think that's actually a feminist approach is just engaging the realities that are taking place today and trying to illuminate just in what ways these are complex environments where we need to take on board what's happening at the local level, what are the perceptions at the local level from what, um, oh, now I, I have a brain fart here. Uh, the last person who just spoke, excellent uh, presentation as well, Luis also. Yeah, um, you know, the, finding all these moments where, where people are experiencing the everyday, including care and, and love, all these moments actually uh, make quite a difference. And it's it's so correct to say that uh, peace and war, it, 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 these two binaries really don't work in the realities that are found today. I mean, there are people who still will have to do their groceries, even though they're in a conflict situation. Um, they, they're going to even clean the house. Uh, they're, they're going to uh, try to get schooling and, and all these sorts of things. So uh, I think to, to try to keep that up, but also, I think we have a lot more work to do 
against the or or together with the policy level in in continuing to demonstrate that this is not just about big state politics and the ways in which what's happening at these other levels is actually highly instrumental to the trajectories of conflict that are taking place today. So that's my short answer. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Louise, you want to say? Go okay, ahead. the other way around. Okay, yeah. so the other Louise. <laughs> yeah. Just briefly, I think, I guess kind of what I've already said, being able to sit with and hold complexity and, and discomfort and actually in contestation. I know there's been discussion about kind of agonistic peace. And I think a lot of the unarmed civilian protection practitioners that I, I work with and I've interviewed often talk about the difference between violence and conflict. And they're quite clear that it's not their job to end conflict, but rather to try and reroute the aggression and reroute conflict through different means. So while they're trying to reduce direct physical violence and some manifestations of structural and systemic violence, although that, that's a kind of very, another conversation again, how to decolonize um, a practice like this. It's really important I think to um, hold these contestations together and to realize and think more about what it is that we're pursuing. Is it a complete lack of conflict? Because that might never happen. So if we accept that conflict will continue, but we want a reduction of violence, then we need mechanisms through which conflict can be kind of waged and uncomfortable and contested without kind of um, violence coming back. Exactly how we do that, I don't know. Um, but I think being clear about what it is that we're working towards in the end is important because I think it's easy to say we're working towards peace, but whose peace do we mean? Um, when we talk about con conflict and how do we know conflict? Whose knowledge counts as knowledge on conflict? There are so many of these big questions that I think we need to be far more clear about. Um, before we get to a stage of saying, where is the peace? Celia? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I think I, I want to try to maybe go a little uh, practical. Um, and I'm not saying that this is the big problem, but this is one problem. Um, I think there's a lot of institutions that are uh, superficially adopting um, the ideas and findings that feminist peace researchers and and security uh, scholars are, are presenting. And we see uh, like NATO talking about, um, you know, if bringing in a, a gendered perspective, if not quite feminist, but um, Kathleen, uh, Catherine Wright's work, for example, uh, I think is, is very interesting on this. So how we get these institutions, I think I, I wrote down this note, that she identifies NATO, for example, as an international hegemonic masculine institution. And yet it has these, it uses these phrases like, oh, gender, and so important that we have, uh, you know, and, and the way they talk about it is to, you know, increase the uh, percentage of women in the armed forces of the member countries and so on. These are not feminist questions, you know. How do we take the feminist questions and feminist analyses up to that level of policy making and institutions? It's not, you know, what we used to call add women and stir, now it's add gender and stir, but it still does, it lacks the complexity of uh, the work that we'd like to see. And, um, and then maybe just the agency, again, you know, uh, because uh, this was because we were thinking more, I think, of Ukraine when we started uh, preparing for this this panel. Um, like uh, I think you mentioned, uh, Luis. Well, Luis mentioned it. Um, that you know, when we we were watching this, um, the, this the conflict in Ukraine break out and uh, and people fleeing. This focus on women fleeing. You know the you know how they were uh, deprived of agency. We saw the Ukrainian people as women running and men staying, 22% uh, of the Ukrainian military are women. Uh, they are staying and they are fighting. That's more than the percentage of women in the Ukrainian par parliament, if I'm correct. I think it's like, uh, that's around 20%. 
So where do women have agency? They need it in the political sphere, uh, and they need it in the decision-making, policy-making institutions, uh, and we need to uh, study their agency, uh, not just their victimhood. Thank you. Louise? Yeah, I, I think, uh, I think I'll, I'll stay on the, on the positive uh, track in the sense that um, I, I think one of the, the things that have sort of been really picked up on and sort of explored further and think uh, goes to these structural aspects of, of gender inequality and, and what that means for society and how we then think around what the, the, that means for, for how society uh, develops. So coming into this as I do from a more like a comparativist uh, perspective, uh, I think now that uh, uh, it's uh, Dahlem and Wieg that show that uh, having data for the last 200 years that when women's rights, political rights, increases, then the chance of peace increases substantially. And this is, this is published in one of the best journals there are, so the, the, the testing of this is substantial. Uh, and that also, I think, means something for us that we, like we have been discussing over the last days. Now we're seeing a pushback on women's rights and, and the authoritarian regimes that are targeting this. Uh, so actually, to, to, to underline what's been discussed here, that what we are talking about here is something that is quite fundamental for how we actually move forward on peace. Uh, so I think the, the, the individual localized level is critical, but I think also the, the, the macro level implications of what we're talking about here is also quite substantial. So how do we sort of make these, these connections between the localized and, and the broader, uh, and how do we sort of use that also to leverage, I think, on the political level? And in that, I think also it, it's important. There was a, a really good article by Badal, uh, Bjorndal, and uh, Pispico uh, a few years ago that that try to tease out sort of when we say that violence is gendered, what do we actually mean? Because there's like an over tendency to say that when women are targeted with violence, the violence is gendered. When men are targeted with violence, that's not gendered. Uh, but what they also show is that, well, there actually many times when, when women are the targets of violence, it's not because, they, because of their gender. And gender is actually not a relevant component to that. In other cases, it's a critical component to that. And knowing when, gender is a key role, also makes it possible for us to sort of found counter strategies and, and sort of push back and, and find sort of feminist strategies to, to push back on violence. And I think I would like to see something similar in terms of, of the agency. So when are, are sort of gender roles used to political and we mobilize? When, when is that actually a critical point in women participating? When are they mobilized on, on other uh, identities and, and when is it so that, that these intersect so that we actually better understand agency and sort of move away from sort of equating women with this. And I think this is really critical for us. Uh, I think now when we're moving, since in women, peace and security is like the international norm here, that pushing this agency is critical, but that's still the component we lack last. And now we're moving to the 25th anniversary. So. Thank you so much for all these, uh, these ideas. So unfortunately, we just have one minute <laughs> left, uh, but uh, I wanted to give the, uh, if there is any, any question or comment uh, in the audience, you must be really tired and looking forward to the coffee break. No, no, no specific comment or question. I don't see very well, but yeah, I, I don't see any hand. So, uh, well, I, we've just, I have the feeling we've just scratched the surface of this very, very complex field. And as I was saying, com constantly expanding, uh, but, uh, but I hope uh, we, we gave you some sort of sense of what the debates are and what are the main ideas and principles. And I want to warmly thank the, the panelists, including the online panelists, uh, for their uh, thought-provoking ideas. And uh, yeah, I hope this is just the, the start of a much uh, broader discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.